Welcome to lecture number 26 in mechanical measurements. In the last lecture, we were actually discussing about the measurement of vacuum pressures, pressures below the atmospheric pressure. We considered one simple case of measurement using a McLeod gauge, which is some kind of a mechanical contrivance because it uses the manometric liquid as a compressing fluid which is going to compress the air or whatever residual gas in the vacuum system to a pressure higher than the pressure early at the beginning, so that the change in the volume is, uh, is uh, related to the, uh, the pressure and uh, we also solved a problem based on this McLaren gauge. So, today what I will do is to continue with the measurement of vacuum. We are going to look at uh, the measurement of higher than what we did last time, high vacuum. The three gauges I am going to talk about are the Pirani gauge, the ion gauge and the alpha tron gauge. These are the three gauges I am going to quickly go through. Then I will change the topic to that of measurement of velocity, which is also a very important activity in uh, most laboratory practice. The reason why I take measurement of velocity soon after the measurement of pressure is that many, many cases the velocity signal or the, the velocity information is converted to a pressure information. So, it is uh, appropriate to keep, take up the measurement of velocity soon after we have done the measurement of pressure and uh, that is the reason why we do that. Let us look at the uh, measurement of high vacuum. So, the Pirani gauge, the principle is very simple. If you have a electrically heated element, the amount of heat that can be transferred from the heated element is related to the speed with which this can be carried by the surrounding fluid. And as the surrounding fluid pressure reduces, the amount of heat it can take away also reduces and therefore, if you heat an element, it will be in the presence of the background pressure, which may be vacuum pressure. If the vacuum as the pressure reduces, the temperature of the element will increase if we keep heating with the same amount of current. The temperature is going to increase. So, as you remember when we were talking about thermometry, if you have a resistance element and we heat it or we pass a current through that, its temperature is going to increase and as the temperature increases, the resistance of the element also changes. So, the change in the resistance is what is going to be measured just as we did in thermometry, but here instead of relating the change in the temperature or the change in the resistance as a consequence of the change in temperature to, a, to the temperature, we are going to link it with the pressure in the background. So, it is essentially the RTD principle, but it is called the Pirani gauge and what we have here is a, the schematic of a Pirani gauge. What we have are two elements, this is resistive element 1, this is the resistive element 2. The first one which is shown in green color here is a vac, is a in communication with the vacuum whose pressure I want to measure and uh, the second one is a compensating uh, resistance which is going to be put inside a sealed vessel, evacuated and sealed, evacuated to a very low pressure, very high vacuum or very low pressure. Therefore, the evacuated and sealed gauge which is shown here 
will not respond to the change in pressure because there is no change in pressure here, it is going to respond to change in the ambient temperature. So, if the ambient temperature changes, it is going to respond and the ambient temperature is also going to respond to change the resistance of this, therefore, that is going to compensate. So, when we say Pirani gauge with compensation for ambient temperature variation, I what I mean is that I am going to use this evacuated and sealed gauge as a compensating element whose change in resistance because of the ambient temperature is going to compensate for the change in resistance of the gauge here. So, to let us see how it is going to operate. I have a source of power and the source of power is going to set a current through the gauge here and also the gauge. It is also going to send a current through R 1, R 2 and R 3. R 3 is a variable resistor. So, what I do is I treat R 1 this gauge R 3 the compensating gauge as a Wedgeton bridge. You can see that this is this forms one arm of the bridge and this forms the other arm of the bridge and the other side is connected to the negative of the battery and the battery is going to provide a source of power. It is going to heat the resistance here and also the resistance here by sending a current through the element. Suppose we we adjust the for example, here you can see what is going to happen. I am going to have when the R 1 this resistance, this resistance, this resistance can be balanced and then when the temperature of this changes with respect to the temperature of this and therefore, the resistance is going to change. So, I am going to keep a constant current through this, uh, 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 this uh, circuit here or I am going to a constant voltage is supplied here. The resistance of this element is going to change because of the pressure to which it is uh, exposed. Therefore, the bridge is going to go out of balance and a certain imbalance current will flow here and this imbalance current will directly be proportional to the vacuum pressure. So, in the case of Pirani gauge, we essentially have four two RTDs or resistance temperature detectors like uh, structures here. These two are heaters. The temperature of the heat the wires change in response to the vacuum pressure and therefore, the resistance changes because of that the western bridge circuit is going to go out of balance and the imbalance is measured by the current which is shown here. And the range of this instrument is from 1 micrometer pressure that is to the power of minus 6 millimeters of mercury to 1 millimeter of mercury 1 torr a gauge or 0 0.1 to 100 pascals. This is the range of this particular instrument. Usually the Pirani gauge is used with the rough vacuum pump. When the rough vacuum pump reduces the pressure of the vacuum space to a value lower than the atmospheric pressure and it reaches the value somewhere in this vicinity. Up to this we can use the from 100 pascals to about 0 0.1 pascal we can use the Pirani gauge. If the vacuum pressure is even lower that is higher vacuum lower pressure I will have to use a different type of gauge. And for that I use what is called an ionization gauge. The principle of the ionization gauge I will explain first and we will see how it operates. So, essentially what the ion gauge has ionization gauge or the ion gauge has it consists of an evacuated a, a glass envelope within which we have a plate three electrodes essentially one is the plate second one is the grid in the in the form of a perforated sheet or it may be in the form of a cylinder. So, I have a grid and then I have a hot filament which is the cathode. Okay. This filament is indirectly heated so that it is at a higher temp high temperature actually it is going to glow like a in the, the filament in a bulb and therefore, it is going to be quite hot. There is one type of ion gauge where the temperature of the filament is high and it is a hot cathode which is going to give out electrons. The electrons are going to be released by the hot method by thermionic emission and let us see what happens to this, this uh, electrons. The electrons are going to move through from the filament to grid because I have got a certain potential difference between the 
filament and the grid. You can see that I have connected a battery here, therefore the grid is positive with respect to the filament or the cathode. The electrons which are ejected from the filament are going to be accelerated towards the grid because it is at a potential higher than the potential of the filament. So, the electrons are going to move in the direction from the filament to the grid and uh, now remember that this is connected to the vacuum system whose pressure I want to measure. Therefore, there are some residual molecules which are present inside this envelope here. So, the electrons which are moving with high velocity because of the accelerating potential are going to hit or collide with the gas molecules, the, the gas molecules which are still present within this space. Of course, the number of gas molecules present will be reducing as the pressure becomes smaller and smaller. Okay. So, the gas molecules are going to be hit by the electrons and the gas molecules are going to become ionized. So, these ions are going to be positive ions and therefore, if I have a plate which is you can see here, it is connected to a battery here such that the plate is negative with respect to the both the grid as well as the filament. Therefore, the positive ions are going to be accelerated towards the plate and the ions are going to be neutralized, ions are going to be neutralized on the plate and therefore, the ions will go through this circuit and give a current due to the ions which I call as the plate current I p. So, the plate current is because of the ions which are going to go and hit the plate and go through this circuit. You also remember that we talked about the electrons to start with, these electrons are going to accelerate, hit the positive the molecules, ionize them and continue towards the grid and the grid is at a positive potential with respect to this, therefore the grid it will pass through this circuit and provide a grid current. So, there are two currents here. The first current due to electrons is to the grid circuit and this is called the grid current I g. The second one is the current through the plate circuit which called the I p or the plate current and there are two currents one due to the electrons and the other due to ions. Now, let us just look at what is the relative magnitudes of this. As the number of molecules are going to dwindle are going to come down, the plate current is going to reduce because the number of gas molecules which are there to be ionized is becoming smaller and therefore, the plate current will become smaller and smaller as the vacuum becomes higher and higher. Therefore, the ratio of these two currents, the I plate current to the grid current is the crucial thing which is going to tell us what is going to be the pressure. The range of this instrument is 1 into 1 to 10 to the power of minus 5 micrometer gauge or 0 0.01 to 10 to the power of minus 6 pascals, very very high vacuum or very very low pressures we are talking about. Let us look at the relationship, the pressure inside the chamber inside that glass envelope is given by the ratio of the plate current to the grid current. You can see that as the vacuum pressure is becoming smaller and smaller, the plate current is going to become smaller and smaller, the gauge the grid current is going to become relatively larger and therefore, this ratio is becoming smaller and smaller. So, as the pressure inside the chamber becomes smaller and smaller that means, higher and higher vacuum the pressure is actually proportional to the ratio of the plate current to the grid current with a sensitivity factor 1 over s and this is the AVRS is called the sensitivity factor. The vacuum pressure as you can see here is a linear function of the ratio of plate current to the grid current. Therefore, you have to measure the plate current, measure the grid current, take the ratio of course, this all can be done electronically multiply by 1 over s and what you see in the meter will indicate directly the pressure in so many micrometers of mercury. The gauge constant S is also is in fact called the ion gauge sensitivity and a typical value of that is 200 divided by cos per, per unit uh, uh, pressure. The unit of pressure used is a tor 200 per tor or it will be given in terms of 2.67 per kilo Pascals. The gauge has a range from 0.1 to 10 to the power of 9 6 Pascal. This is the range of the pressures which it can measure. So, the uh, to just summarize the plate current becomes smaller and smaller as the pressure becomes smaller and smaller. The gauge pressure remains more or less the same and therefore, the pressure is directly proportional to the plate current and of course, inversely proportional to the gauge current, uh, the grid current and the grid current will also vary to some extent and the plate current variation is actually going to mirror the pressure inside the envelope. Usually, the 
envelope is made of glass and the filament works uh, uh, operates around 3000 degrees 2500 degrees so like the electric bulb and usually it is uh, connected to the uh, the vacuum chamber either from outside or it is allowed to hang inside the vacuum chamber. If it is allowed to hang inside the vacuum chamber it also provides illumination. So, you can actually use it to see what is happening inside the vacuum chamber. So, there is an advantage of putting it inside the vacuum chamber allow it to hang inside there and it is going to measure the pressure at the same time also provide illumination within the chamber itself. And uh, usually the way we operate the iron gauge is the first you turn on the vacuum pump the rotary vacuum pump which will reduce the pressure to a sufficiently low value. So, that we can turn on the high vacuum part either the uh, the diffusion pump or any other pump which is going to be used for higher creating higher vacuum that will be operated or that will be started only after the pressure has reduced sufficiently. During the first part when the when the rough vacuum pump is on you can use the Pirani gauge which will be attached to the vacuum system and once the Pirani it will it will show the minimum value after some time after the pressure has come down to sufficient sufficiently low value the Pirani goes, the gauge will uh, indicate almost 0 that means that the, it cannot indicate anything uh, sensitive the sensitivity is very poor there. So, at that time the ion gauge will take over and the ion gauge will give you the pressure. So, this is how it is going to operate. The ionization gauge can also be replaced by what is called a penning gauge. The difference between the ion gauge and the penning gauge is the, the working principle is the same only thing is in the case of the penning gauge the filament is not hot. However, what we do is we have a very large potential difference so that the ionization of the uh, gas residual gas takes place because of the because of the high electric field near the cathode. So, when you have a very high electric field that ionizes the gas instead of the uh, the hot cathode which is going to evolve electrons. So, the the way the ionization is going to be take place is different in the penning gauge, penning is the name of the gauge is different from this. So, I am not going to discuss it further just a just to highlight that you can also have a cold cathode gauge which is also called the penning gauge. The third one which I mentioned is called the alphatron gauge again the principle is similar to the previous gauges. The principle is that you must somehow ionize the gas if you ionize the gas or the residual gas which is present inside the gauge or in the vacuum chamber it will create a current this is the principle and the current will be smaller smaller the pressure this is as simple as that. So, the way we are going to create the ions is different in the case of the alpha tron. In the alpha tron what we have is a radioactive source and it in, in it ejects radioactive the alpha particles for example, I can have a piece of radium here it gives out alpha particles these alpha particles are going to bombard at the gas molecules and the gas get ionized. So, very simple straightforward no high temperature involved no current involved here the radium source is put inside the inside the gauge and the gauge is of course, connected to the vacuum chamber at the side here the radiative source is kept here and we have a needle which is the ion collector the needle is simply a needle which is introduced like this it is insulated from the body and the body itself is in the negative uh, electrode. So, outside I have got simply a resistor and a, and a potential difference by a battery and uh, what happens is that the ions are going to create a current and the current is going to pass through this and there is a certain potential difference out, out across the resistance which is going to mirror the pressure inside. The advantage of the alpha tron gauge is that it can work from the highest pressure to the lowest pressure without any problem because there is no filament no problem with any of those structures it will work even at the atmospheric pressure that is why I have said here range is 0 0.001 to 1000 tor 0 0.001 millimeters of mercury to 1000 tor or 0 0.1 to 10 to the power of 5 pascals. So, the advantage of the alpha tron gauge is the alpha tron is actually a trade name of the gauge made by the alpha tron company. So, the advantage of this is that it can go from atmospheric pressure all the way to the vacuum pressure. 
So there is no need to worry about the safety of the gauge. It is simply the radiative, radioactive piece of material which is going to be present there. So basically what we have done is to quickly go through the different types of gauges which are used for the measurement of high vacuum and I think this is sufficient for the sufficient exposure for the beginner. If uh, one wants to learn more one can always go to higher uh, books which specialize on high vacuum engineering that is what I would recommend the student to do if he is really keen or interested. And usually mechanical engineers do not come across high vacuums in their day to day, day, -to -day activities. It is the chemists and physicists who usually work with high vacuum and uh, they will of course need to know more about the vacuum, how to create it, how to measure it and so on. So with this we will formally complete our discussion on pressure measurement. We have, con we have considered just to re recapitulate what we have done in the last few classes, we have considered different types of uh, pressure measuring instruments starting from manometer, we also considered different types of gauges and then we also discussed the uh, transient response of these uh, gauges due to process connections and so on and then we have looked at the vacuum measurement of vacuum pressures or very high very low pressures and uh, that has more or less completed the uh, discussion on pressure measurement. The next quantity I am going to look at is the measurement of velocity. <coughs> of course velocity measurement may involve the velocity of uh, particulates, particles, it can involve the velocity of liquids, it may also involve the velocity of uh, gases. We will for our preference we will look at only the measurement of velocity of uh, uh, either liquids or gases. The velocities of uh, particles and so on is not of uh, much importance to us and therefore we will not be looking at it. We are going to concentrate on the measurement of velocity of either liquids or gases and therefore we can say fluid velocity is the quantity which is measured. Corresponding to the fluid velocity that is also another uh, thing which we may be interested in the measurement of flow rate. Suppose a flow is taking place within a duct or a tube, we may be interested in measuring the velocity at every point within that fluid uh, flow domain. We may also be interested in finding out how much fluid is crossing any cross section of the tube in unit time. So the measurement of flow rate is a sequel to the measurement of velocity. So the measurement of flow rate I am going to take a look at as a in a different module because I am going to look at it as a measurement of a, a, a quantity which is a, a somewhat not like if you remember what we said to start with we were looking at the pressure, temperature and the velocity these are all uh, these are all variable with respect to location within the within the domain and therefore we are talking about functions of uh, space and therefore these are field quantities. So the velocity is now looked upon as a field quantity and therefore I am going to look at the field quantity measurement in this particular in the next one or two lectures and then we will come to the flow rate at a later stage. What are the different ways of measuring the velocity of a fluid? So I am just giving here a few different types of measurement practices. One is to use velocity measurement, use a pitot tube this is a pitot tube or a pitot static tube, either a pitot tube or a pitot static tube is going to help in determining the velocity at a point, at a point and uh, therefore I can use a pitot tube or a pitot static tube to map the velocity variation within a flow domain. Therefore that is the advantage of the pitot tube or pitot static tube. The operating principle of the pitot tube or the pitot static tube is the the fluid mechanics principles are involved and therefore we will be digressing a little bit and then learning about these principles so that we can use the, uh, the pitot tube or the pitot static tube for the measurement of velocity. The second uh, method which you can think of is again we are coming back again and again to the thermal type of measurement. A hot wire anemometer is simply nothing but a resistance whose temperature is going to respond to the velocity of the fluid which is flowing past that. Just a little while ago we talked about a Pirani gauge. The Pirani gauge the temperature of the of the wire or the of the, uh, the element heated element depends on the ambient pressure. So the pressure reduces 
the temperature is going to increase because we are heating it with a certain amount of uh, we are putting a certain amount of heat into it by sending a current and this is going to increase the temperature is going to increase as the pressure decreases. In that case in the case of Pirani gauge we are looking at the pressure as a function of the temperature of the element whereas here in the case of a thermal uh, velocity measurement technique which is known as the hot wire anemometer I am going to send a current through an element and keep its either keep the temperature of the element constant or allow it to vary uh, there are two different ways of uh, working with it. The basic principle is that the amount of heat which can, uh, the that can be dissipated from the element depends on the flow velocity. If the flow velocity increases we know from our heat transfer studies that the heat transfer coefficient is going to increase because of convection and if the heat transfer coefficient increases for a given temperature it can dissipate more heat or for a given if you put a given amount of heat the temperature of the element is going to become smaller. If the temperature reduces the resistance of the element will change and it will again it can be measured as a change in resistance can be measured as a change in the temperature change in the temperature can be ascribed to the velocity of the fluid. So, the hot wire meter is a thermal effect meter thermal effect or flow on a hot wire element is what is used in the hot wire thermometer. <coughs> the third one is called the laser Doppler velocity meter. In this case of course, the Doppler effect is going to be the main method and we will of course, discuss it more fully later. The Doppler effect takes place when the laser light is scattered from particles which may be present naturally in the flow. When the flow contains consists or contains some particles if you assume that the particles are moving along with the flow at the same velocity <coughs> the laser beam is going to strike on the particles and therefore they are going to be scattered and because of the velocity of the laser the the particles the light which is scattered is going to have a different frequency. So, we are going to measure the Doppler shift in the frequency and we are going to relate the Doppler shift to the velocity of the particle and the velocity of the particle is going to be related to the velocity of the fluid which is carrying the particles. If you assume that the particles are very small and they do not have any slip with respect to the flow of the fluid that means that the fluid velocity and the particle velocity are the same then we can measure by using the Doppler shift we can measure the velocity of the particles and say that it is the same as the velocity of the fluid. The advantage of the laser Doppler velocity meter is that it uh, is a non intrusive method non intrusive method while the two methods number 1 and 2 the pitot tube pitot static tube as well as the hot wire anemometer are intrusive in nature that means that means that I am going to introduce some probe into the flow field and whatever may be the size of the flow of the probe however small it is it is going to certainly affect the flow field. This is from fluid mechanics we learn that there will be some kind of an effect of the probe on the flow field it will disturb the flow field. However, the laser Doppler thermometer in the case of laser Doppler the laser beam itself is not going to disturb significantly and therefore, we can say that the laser Doppler velocity meter is almost like a non intrusive method. So, the three methods I have labeled them labeled here the first two are actually probe techniques because we are going to introduce something into the flow and the third one is a non intrusive technique where only a light beam or a two beams of light are going to intercept the molecules of the flow fluid which is flowing. The third important point is that the laser Doppler velocity meter the control volume over which this measurement is then it done is very very small that means that it is almost like making point measurement. In the case of pitot tube pitostatic tube as well as the hot wire anemometer there is a physical size to the probe and therefore, the velocity is averaged over this physical size which is not insignificant it is going to be finite whereas, in the case of laser Doppler instrument the size of this control volume is so small there is almost like measuring the flow or the velocity at a point that is the main advantage and therefore, if I use a laser Doppler instrument and uh, and measure the velocities at various points within the flow I can get a very good map of the velocity field 
whereas the other two are going to give somewhat less accurate picture. The laser Doppler is going to give you a very accurate picture of the velocity field. So, let us look at the other types the uh, the first type is what I am going to look at first the pitot tube and pitot stretch tube and then of course, we will come back to the other ones as we go along. So, the first thing we are going to look at is the velocity measurement using pitot tube and let us look at two things. One is we look at how the pitot tube is arranged, what is the guiding principle of operation and then we will of course, we will take up an example later on. So, I have shown here a tube which is carrying a flu fluid flowing at a velocity v and my intention is to measure the velocity of the fluid. Of course, in this case I have shown the pitot tube, pitot tube is nothing but a small diameter tube with a hole in the front here at the tip, there is a hole at the tip and the hole communicates through this to a U tube manometer and the other end of the tube is connected to what is called a static tap on the periphery of the tube. So, there are two connections to the pitot tube, one is the connection here to the at the side of the tube that is called the static tap. We will describe why it is called static tap in a, uh, in a little while from now. We also have a hole in the tube which is going to be facing the flow, it is going to face the flow. And I have got a manometric liquid here and let us see what is going to happen. The flow is coming from this side, it is going to come and it is going to come to rest at the stagnation front stagnation point of the pitot tube which co coincides with the hole in the front of the tube. The streamlines are going to divide and go from the sides and uh, therefore, the pressure at the at the point shown here at this point is going to be the stagnation pressure where whereas, the pressure measured by the static tap which is connected to the side of the tube is going to be the static pressure we will describe this terminology in a little while from now. The static pressure, the pressure and the stagnation pressure, the difference is actually the dynamic head or the head due to this velocity of the liquid or the fluid which is moving in the tube. So, the difference here H m is the manometric height which is measured here is convertible to a delta p and delta p which is measured by this head H m is nothing but the difference in pressure between the stagnation point and the static pressure at the wall. So, the head H m which is measured here you see now what we are doing we are converting the velocity which is going to give rise to a an increased pressure at the stagnation point. This increase in pressure is because V is going to be brought to 0. So, this process is called the stagnation process, the velocity which is v is going to become 0 at the stagnation point here and therefore, along the streamline if you apply the Bernoulli principle, the pressure is going to continuously increase and become equal to the stagnation pressure at the stagnation point and the velocity is going to be 0 at that particular point. Here the pressure is going to be the velocity, the static pressure and therefore, the pressure difference between here and here which is measured by the manometric head H m is related to the pressure difference which is equal to which is related to the dynamic head, dynamic head is in terms of v squared by 2, v squared by 2. So, the kinetic head or the velocity head therefore, I can measure the velocity from the H m which is measured. So, this is a pitot tube with a static tap on the wall of the tube and the stagnation being shown by the hole which is going to be connected to this. This tube is going to give you the stagnation pressure and static pressure is here. In the case of phytostatic tube, what we do is we combine the two on the same probe. We combine 
the static tap or the static hole as well as the stagnation hole on the same probe. In the case of the pitot-static tube, in the case of pitot tube, pitot tube is separate, stagnation hole is different, the static hole is on the periphery of the tube. In the case of pitot-static tube, both the stagnation as well as the static holes are presented present in the probe itself. Let us look at the way it is going to be arranged. I have a tube as in the previous case which is going to face the flow, the velocity is here, the flow is taking place here. The probe consists of an inner tube, you can follow the inner tube here as I am showing there is the inner tube. So, inner tube and there is an outer annulus, outer annulus which is connected to the other side of the manometer. So, the outer outer annulus is connected to the other side of the manometer and you can see here there are holes on the periphery of the outer tube somewhere downstream of the stagnation point. The stagnation point is here, the static holes are somewhat in the downstream of that hole and I will mention exactly where it is going to be located in the next slide. So, the static holes are on the annular portion, the stagnation hole is in the front and the pressure difference is between the stagnation point here and the static pressure through the static holes. And in fact, what we normally do is on the periphery of the outer tube, on the periphery of the outer tube, there will be small holes uniformly spaced across the uh, along the periphery of the tube. We have small holes, so it uh, actually uh, averages the pressure around the tube at this particular section. Again, the static pressure, stagnation pressure is out acting on this side the static pressure is acting on this side, the difference in head between the two sides is actually going to be dynamic head and the dynamic head is going to be related to the velocity and the velocity is therefore measured by measuring the this head here. So, let us look at the details of how the pitot static tube is uh, actually made. I have made a slightly larger sketch, this is the inner tube which is connected to this this uh, portion here and the velocity is going to be V here and is going to come to stagnation at this particular point. The static holes about 4 to 8 1 millimeter diameter holes on the periphery are going to be at a downstream location greater than 4 D at least it should be greater than 4 diameters where diameter is the diameter of the probe diameter proof the probe can be about 7 to 8 millimeters. So, you see this is about 8 millimeters, 8 millimeters about third of an inch and the location is 4 times that diameter more than 4 times typically 8 diameters 8 into 8 millimeters will give about 60 millimeters from here to here. And between these holes and the place where this is going to be bent the tube is bending here I must have 8 diameters. So, the length from here to here is roughly equal to 16 diameters. So, if you make the pitot-static tube smaller in diameter, this will become smaller. So, the length from here to here is dependent on the diameter of the probe itself. We can make uh, probes as small as 3, 2 to 3 millimeters in diameter also. Okay? We can make very small one. And the curvature here in the bending in this portion should be something like 3 times the diameter, the radius of curvature of the mean line. I am talking about the tube mean axis of this one should be about 3 diameters. So, the pitot-static tube, the reason why we do these things will become clear once we look at the theoretical uh, framework based, uh, on which the whole thing is based. So, with this background, let us look at the pitot tube as a means of velocity measurement. Let us look at the basic uh, fundamental ideas about it, what are the principles involved and let us look at what is going to be the relationship between the velocity and the pressure head we are going to measure using the, the manometer which is an integral part of the 
pitot-static tube or the pitot tube. So, the pitot-static tube or the pitot tube I can represent by a block body like this. This is a body. This is a cross section is circular like this. and it is facing the flow, flow is coming like this. Coming, coming like that, and uh, what will happen to the streamlines is that the streamline comes here, the streamlines neighboring streamlines are going to go like that go like that okay and the at this point we have what is called the stagnation point so i'm going to apply the bernoulli principle or Bernoulli theorem to a streamline. Of course, you will have learned this Bernoulli theorem in your fluid mechanics course. So, I will take a point very far away and I will take the point A O here. This let us call this as point A. Point A is far away. When I say far away, I can interpret the following way. Suppose, this is the diameter. I can take it a few diameters away essentially okay. and I am going to apply the Bernoulli principle which says that the total pressure or the stagnation pressure is a constant along a streamline. So, I will say P T is the stagnation pressure It is also called the total pressure, which is given by at the point A, I am going to have the pressure equal to let us say P infinity, this corresponds to P infinity, and the velocity is u, let us say, this is u plus half rho infinity u square. This is at the point A. And uh, at O, again stagnation pressure equal to the pressure at O because u equal to 0 at O, u equal to 0 at O when u becomes 0 at that particular point, the pressure goes up because the total pressure remains constant. I am assuming ideal fluid flow that means, there is no friction and other, other things are ignored because we will later see how to account for them. So, the total pressure or the stagnation pressure given by P infinity plus half rho infinity squared is the same as the pressure at the point O. So, let us look at the consequence of that. So, the H m is the pitostatic tube or pitot tube reading using a manometric fluid of density rho m, we can see that the delta p which is measured, the pressure difference which is measured will be given by rho m g into h m, where rho m is the density of the manometric liquid.
So, we have the manometric liquid with density equal to rho m. We know that the pressure difference which is measured by the either the pitot tube, pitot tube with a static tap on the wall of the tube or pitot tube both are going to give the same information. The advantage of the pitot static tube is that there is only one probe you do not have to make a hole on the periphery of the tube otherwise there is no difference really. The advantage is that you can just make one hole and introduce the pitot static tube into the stream. So, rho m into g h m is equal to delta p m and this must be equal to p total minus p infinity because that is the pressure difference I am measuring. And uh, from the expression for p t we know that p t minus p infinity is nothing but p infinity plus half rho infinity u squared minus p infinity equal to half rho infinity u squared. Remember that is rho infinity is the density of the flowing fluid. Rho m is the manometric fluid density, rho infinity is the flow density of the fluid which is flowing in the tube. Okay. So, I can combine these two now and say that half rho infinity u squared is equal to rho m g h m. Okay. And therefore, I can solve for u the velocity. So, you can see that the velocity u will come out to be I can make a little space here. So, I will say u is equal to therefore, u is equal to rho m 2 rho m g h m divided by rho infinity under the square root sign. So, the velocity of the fluid is equal to square root of 2 times the manometric density multiplied by the gravitational constant multiplied by the head which is measured by the manometer divided by the rho infinity. You now you see that we have converted the measure of velocity. You can see this is nothing but something like some constant k times square root of h m. The relationship u is equal to some constant. Constant is nothing but the square root of 2 into rho m g by rho infinity is the constant multiplied by the square root of h m. So, the instrument is nonlinear basically because the velocity is proportional to square root of the head developed okay, k root h m and uh, the velocity information has been converted to pressure information and the manometer has further converted the pressure information to the head of the height of the column information. Therefore, I am measuring the velocity in terms of a manometric height which is going to be the result of the pitot-static tube being used for the measurement of density or the measurement of the velocity. Let us look at the a few more details and what I have done is I have plotted a simple sketch here. This is just to understand what is the proportioning of the of the pitot-static tube. So, I have again indicated the pitot-static tube, pitot tube as a bluff body and I am looking at the change in the or the flow around the around this body. The flow is coming with the velocity u and because of the body it has to go around it. We are assuming that the flow is ideal flow without friction. The friction effect can be taken care of by a suitable factor a little later on we will come to that. The diameter of the probe is d and what I am doing is I am trying to find out what is the pressure relationship pressure variation with respect to the location along the along the body. Okay. For that I plot the p indicated at any location x measured as shown here. Actually I am measuring x as a ratio of x to d. So, what I do is this is what I have plotted is x by d. So, x by d 
equal to 1, 2, 3, etcetera. I am measuring the difference between the pressure at any particular point minus the static pressure divided by half rho infinity u square. This is the dynamic head or dynamic pressure. So, the pressure difference as the ratio of the dynamic pressure. And you remember at the stagnation point, this must be equal to the this difference must be equal to half rho infinity square. Therefore, the value of this will be exactly equal to 1 at the x equal to 0 or x by d equal to 0. And uh, let us see what happens as we move along this along this like like uh, I have shown by arrow if I if I move along this the velocity is going to change because it is now encountering a body it has to adjust itself. So, the velocity is going to continuously change and in the first in this portion the velocity is increasing and because the velocity is increasing it is not decreasing actually it is increasing. The pressure total the pressure indicated minus v infinity by half rho infinity square this is going to become smaller and smaller and at a particular at some point it is going to become equal to 0 that means that indicate indicated pressure equal to static pressure and then it keeps going down because the pressure velocity is now increasing beyond that and therefore it goes to a minimum somewhere here near about a point 8 or point 9 d and then start again increasing the pressure starts increasing and if you see here about x by d of roughly equal to 4 this uh, difference has become 0 the pressure has become equal to the static pressure. That means, somewhere here if you measure the pressure by making a hole on the probe if you measure the pressure that will be nothing but the static pressure. Therefore, the requirement is that the x by d must be greater than 4 that is what I mentioned earlier and normally we take the x by d as about a value of 8 to be on the better safer side. Another one or two small points we will discuss. The second point is let us look at the flow around this body. Some uh, ideas from fluid mechanics we require and I will just uh, give the gist of the argument. If you assume that the fluid flow is taking place at a sufficiently high Reynolds number. So, Reynolds number R e if it is more than about 300 based on the diameter of the probe. So, R e d will be nothing but u multiplied by d divided by nu where u is the velocity d is the diameter of the probe and nu is the kinematic viscosity of the fluid which is flowing. If this is greater than 500 the boundary layer is very thin. So, there is a boundary layer is very thin and the pressure drop pressure loss or loss due to friction is also very small and therefore, for values of R e d greater than 300 the value the formula which I gave earlier is more or less ok. So, the formula can be modified by introducing a coefficient why do we require the coefficient if there is friction there will be some pressure drop due to friction therefore whatever pressure drop i am measuring it contains also pressure drop some amount of pressure drop due to friction effect but when i am measuring i don't know what which portion is due to friction which portion is due to the stagnation process when i am stagnating the velocity head is going to be added to the static head. Now, because there is a certain amount of friction the amount of pressure difference consists also or not only of the dynamic head also of some amount of frictional head due to friction loss. Because I do not know what that is what I have to what I will be interpreting is that the pressure difference h m rho m into g h m is nothing but u squared by 2 that is what we said rho u squared by no, it also contains a little bit of frictional effect. Therefore, I have to multiply the formula by a coefficient which we call as c. So, if I go back to the previous slide, I will multiply this by a factor c, 
this is a C is something like 0 0.98 to 1 depending on the Reynolds number. If the Reynolds number is greater than 500, so RED greater than 500 C equal to 1. So, we can multiply by a small fact a factor 0 0.98 to account for the effect of friction and in fact, let me just discuss a little more about this friction portion. If you look at the flow around this body, if the boundary layer is very thin, the boundary layer theory tells us that the pressure across the boundary layer remains the same. That means, that the pressure I am measuring is the same as the pressure in the main stream or the free stream here. Therefore, I am when I said the pressure has become equal to the static pressure, the meaning is very clear. From here to here, whatever pressure difference, pressure changes I am showing here are also the change of the pressure along the boundary itself. If you were to put a static hole all along this periphery and measure the pressure locally, you will see that there is going to be just this value whatever we are getting here is nothing but the static pressure variation along the boundary. This comes from the boundary layer theory. Assuming that the boundary layer is very thin and that is satisfied once you have a Reynolds number based on the diameter greater than about 300, it is going to be thin and therefore, it is more or less satisfied requirement. But in order to allow for this small effect of the friction, we can multiply by factor which I showed in the previous slide. I will introduce a factor C which is between 0 0.98 and 1 to account for the presence of friction. So, to just recapitulate what we have done, we have started looking at the measurement of velocity in a, in a flow. And in fact, there are many more interesting points which we will have to talk about. For example, I never talked about the direction of the flow. So, if I go back to the go back to this figure here, I have conveniently put, put the probe such that it is exactly normal to the flow which is coming in this direction. The flow is coming directly onto it, right. Suppose I do not know the flow direction. This is the let us assume that this is the flow direction. If I put the probe like this, will it also give you the proper value? If I put it like this, that is, if it is at an angle with respect to the flow, what is going to happen? It is a very important thing because in some situations we may not know the direction of the flow, and therefore, we have to be careful about how to align the pitot tube to get the proper value. There are some probes which are specifically de de developed so that a small amount of angular inaccuracy in the or small angle between the direction of flow and the direction of the axis of the probe is not going to be important. So, we will look at some of these features in the next lecture. Thank you.